Tonight, we feature a conversation with Chris Hayashi, Executive Director of the Audre Lord Project, and Glenn Francis, Executive Director of Griot Circle, both at the forefront of organizing LGBT people of color. Hey man, how you doing? <laughs> good, good. It's been you? a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so tell me what's up with ALP these days. When I came into the organization, um, AL, the Audre Lorde Project had gone through a shift um, in mission and focus to wow. prioritizing uh, community organizing, grassroots organizing in our work, um, and making that much more central. So one example is we have an immigrant rights project mm. um, led and run by lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, trans, and gender nonconforming immigrants of color. It's meant really mobilizing um, folks within immigrant communities who are LGBTST folks of color um, to organize around those issues and to build community with each other. Uh, the Audre Lorde Project launched uh, a trans and gender nonconforming organizing project, uh, Trans Justice. We've been focusing our work most recently on uh, discrimination and harassment that people are facing when they're trying to access public assistance right. and yeah. welfare. Right. Um, you know, we hear stories of trans um, trans women who talk about going to see their caseworker, and the caseworker will purposefully call out their masculine name yeah. um, in front of other workers, in yeah. front of other clients, um, and things like that really prohibiting folks' access to services. So we've been doing this whole campaign to try and call on the city to put policies and procedures in place that are going to train workers and prevent the discrimination and harassment that people yeah, are facing. It, I mean, it, you're talking about cultural competency on exactly. every level. Um, how are things going to grill? Being the only... Um, intergenerational, culturally diverse <laughs> senior <laughs> center here in the city. Griot kind of started as this um, response to the AIDS crisis in the early 80s. In fact, um, Regina Shavers, who was the executive director before me and the founder of Griot Circle, was very instrumental. Uh, in fact, a couple of her friends at the time were battling HIV and they were losing their home and there were some other issues as well going on. And looking at the community uh, for benefits or to support these people in crisis, she found there was, no, there was no response to that. She thought that there should be a community response and the community response came to be Griot Circle. Uh, we're still battling HIV I and mean, we have what well, we have, the, the, the statistics are like 71% of everyone over 40 is HIV positive. Okay. We have the baby boom generation who is going to be turning um, 60 within the next, what, five years? And that's a whole new pandemic of HIV. It's one of the, it's one of the main things we're working. There are two, two components to that. One is the HIV component, which we're doing, and the other one is um, the cultural competency piece, which we're doing with, um, with senior centers throughout the city. It's, it, it's tough, it's tough to find um, senior centers who would tell you that there are no gay people in the center. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> that tells me more how much training you need as well as your staff. You know, because if people who were born in the 20s and 30s and 40s are still living their lives in, in fear and in isolation, then something is wrong. You know, one of the programs we have is a program we named the internship program. LGBT youth that go to schools within the New York City area can come to Creo Circle as a certified training tra site and be able to get computer training and be able to be mentored. I mean, these kids come in and they just, they never knew that we lived to be 50. <laughs> And then when they come in and they see all these older folks hanging out and doing wood carving and on the computers and on the internet and, I mean, and just doing administrative tasks that they're willing to do, it's quite amazing to see the response from them. You know, isolation for folks in our community yeah. is such a huge issue. I mean, um, it makes me think about this, uh, this one um, trans woman, trans woman of color, mm -hmm. um, who you know, talked about how she felt so isolated, felt, um, you know, afraid to actually even step outside of her apartment every day because mm -hmm. of the type of harassment that she was facing on the streets, um, you know, in the subways and so on. And coming to trans justice meetings was 
um, you know, basically knowing that they could actually change something. And so making right. that, taking that step to, to leave their apartment and to get involved in groups like Trans Justice and organizing, saying to them, you know, these are, this is what's happening. This is what needs to change. The stories like that, you know, really, for me, are what, are what the work's about, you know, yeah. like folks who like are struggling on a daily basis just to survive, um, but know that their survival is connected to being able to to organize and to be part of movements. Absolutely, you know, Audre Lorde has a quote that says, "If you don't define yourself for yourself, then others will basically define you," and um, and so it's really interesting that um, that we as people of color organizations are. Uh, really care to empowering our communities. As you know, we get less less than 1% of the LGBT funding comes to people of color communities. A lot of times, um, folks uh, are trying to win issues or do things for us, yes. um, you know, when clearly we're able to do that for ourselves. <laughs>